So we've been kind of tiptoeing around Hess's law now with thermochemical equations, but let's go ahead and actually start applying Hess's law. Hess's law states that the total enthalpy change, delta H, for a process is the same regardless of whether the reaction occurs in one step or many steps. What does this really mean? Well, this is how I can say if a reaction is reversed, the sign of delta H is reversed. This is um, how I can use different reactions to figure out the delta H reaction that I may not be able to measure directly. What I mean by this is like, let's say I drive to work. I drive one path to work, I drive the same path home. It's the same distance, no matter which way I go, right? As long as I'm driving the same road, I'm driving the same distance. Kind of the same thing with a reaction. If a reaction occurs and it takes five kilojoules of heat for the reaction to occur, then the reverse reaction would give away that amount of heat. Law of conservation of mass, right? I can't create nor destroy things. So if a certain amount went into a reaction, if I do that reaction in reverse, then that certain amount of heat is going to come out. The magnitude of delta H, meaning how big it is, is directly proportional to the quantities of reactants and products in a reaction. If the coefficients in a balanced reaction are multiplied by a number, the value of delta H is multiplied by the same factor. So a couple little diagrams over here to talk about quick. What I see here is enthalpy. Enthalpy, again, is related to the heat of the reaction. And so I see what this means is lower and higher, right? More heat went in, um, or you can say less and more, whatever. This has more heat put into it, so it's at a higher energy level. It's at a lower heat energy level. It had less heat put in. I've got reactants A plus B here. I'm trying to go to 2D. Well, what if A plus B actually go through an intermediate phase where they make C, and then C somehow reacts to form 2D? That's completely fine and commonly done. There's a, del there's a heat of reaction associated with that transition from um, A plus 2B going to C. And we see here that it is a positive value. But then C going to 2D has a delta H value that would be a negative because the, the heat of reaction is going to be released from the system. Overall, delta H3, which is what I'm interested in, the process of going from 2A straight to 2B, to 2D, I apologize, would be the summation of those. It would be the delta H plus 1 plus delta H plus 2. Now, delta H plus 1 happens to be a positive value. Delta H plus 2 happens to be a negative value. And overall, delta H plus 3 will be a negative value. But it's the summation of all of them together for the process we're actually looking for. Kind of shown here as well, my initial state versus my final state. I'm trying to figure out the delta H of a certain reaction. And maybe I can't measure that reaction directly. There's a number of reasons why, and I'll talk about that in just a sec. But I can go through an intermediate. From my initial state, I can go through intermediate A, intermediate A state, final, st and then from A to my final state. The summation of these two energies, how much this took and how much this took, is going to be equal to my desired value. If I went through an intermediate B, same thing. The summation of delta HBI and delta HBF will be the same as the delta H desired. Now, I'll show you an example in the next slide on how we can actually manipulate this, but what, why would I want to do this? Well, for example, in Chem, um, chem 2 Lab, there's a reaction we do that um, we can't measure directly. We would need to use a bomb calorimeter. I want to know the enthalpy of formation for magnesium oxide. In order to do that, we have to add a very specific amount of oxygen to the magnesium, and we just can't do that under regular open container under constant pressure conditions. And it's just difficult to do. So instead, I do two other reactions. I react magnesium oxide with hydrochloric acid for magnesium chloride and water, and I re react magnesium metal with hydrochloric acid for magnesium chloride and hydrogen gas. I then give students the values for a reaction for water, and they can be able to use Hess's law to figure out the actual targeted reaction, the reaction we're trying to find the value of. So Hess's law is really useful to us because if we can't measure reaction directly, we may be able to measure a set of other reactions and get to the, um, the target reaction. Basically obtaining the information we need without doing a more difficult process. Let's go ahead and apply this. Use Hess's law to calculate delta H for this reaction. This is what I'm going to call your target reaction. It's the reaction you're trying to find the delta H of. You're going to manipulate the other equations so that when you add them up, the summation of them will equal your target reaction. So let's look at the first one. Here I've got 
one mole of carbon monoxide reacting with a half a mole of oxygen and forming one mole of CO2. The way I do this is I think about it like a puzzle. I compare this to my target reaction. These are what I call your given reactions. I'm going to compare and see what species in my given reactions compare to my target reaction. Well, I see I've got carbon monoxide and I've got carbon monoxide. I've got CO2 and I've got CO2. So those definitely I need, but they're on the wrong side of the reaction. So I'm going to flip this reaction around. I'm going to write CO2, gas, giving me CO, gas, a half a mole of O2 gas. Now, what's not on here and should be, because I keep forgetting to put them on the slide, and I apologize, is the delta H values. They're in the notes, but they are not in the slides. 283.0 kilojoules. So if you're using student notes, you have them. If you're just using the slides, you don't have them, and I apologize. I keep forgetting to put these in here. 571.6 kilojoules. It is a negative there. And this one is delta H is equal to negative 44.0 kilojoules. Now, when I flip that first reaction, I need to flip the sign on delta H here because now I'm going in the opposite direction. So this becomes positive 283.0 kilojoules. I'm now going to check my second one. I've got two moles of water. I've got water in the reaction. I've got two moles of hydrogen gas. I've got hydrogen gas in the reaction. And then one mole of O2. I don't see any O2. Well, the first issue I have is that they are on the wrong side. Water is on the rea um, reactant side of my given equation, but the product side of my target equation. And hydrogen is on the um, reactant side of my given equation, or target equation, but the product side of my given equation. So I need to flip this around. But the other issue I have is this two here. I only want one mole and one mole. So I'm going to divide this reaction by two, or multiply three by one half. So flip it and divide by two. When I do that, I'm going to get H2 gas. Notice I divided by two, so I don't have a coefficient of two anymore. Plus a half a mole of O2 gas, because one, you know, one O2 divided by two is one half, giving me one mole of H2O gas. Or sorry, that is a liquid right there. H2O liquid. Phases do matter in these. Delta H is going to now be a negative 571.6 divided by 2 kilojoules. And the last one, H2O gas and H2O liquid. Well, what I forgot to look at earlier was the phase here. This phase does not match this. I need gas over there. So luckily I have this. Now I did figure it out because the hydrogen here, but luckily I have this here because I actually need this H2O gas on the other side of the reaction. So I'm going to have to flip this one as well. But I only need one mole of it, so I should be good to go. H2O liquid, giving me H2O gas. I flipped it, so it's now positive 44.0 kilojoules. Now I'm going to do a little rearranging here just so we can see this a little bit better. Putting all of the reactants, all of their arrows together. For me, it's just easier to see it because we're going to play a canceling game now. and then my delta H values. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through here, and anything that is on both sides of the reaction can be canceled out. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean, like, I've got a half a mole of O2 right here, and i got a half a mole of O2 right here, but they are on opposite sides of the reaction, so they get canceled out. If they were on the same side, they would add together, but because they're on opposite sides of the reaction, I can cancel them out. It's just like any other numerical calculation. It's like saying I have negative one on both sides of the reaction. I'm canceling them out. I see what else I can cancel. Well, I've got H2O liquid and H2O liquid, and it's one mole of each. They have to match the moles. If they don't match, then only the amount of moles that actually match will cancel out. So like if I had, you know, one mole of O2 here and a half a mole of O2 here, I would cancel this out and have a half a mole of O2 over here is what I mean by that. Let's see, it looks like I can't cancel anything else out. So I've got CO2 gas reacting with H2 gas. I'm going to write these on the top. 
CO2 gas reacting with H2 gas, giving me CO gas and H2O gas. I compare that to my hard equation. One mole of CO2 gas, one mole of H2 gas, one mole of CO gas, one mole of H2O gas. I've got my correct values. Now all I have left to do is add this up. 283 kilojoules minus 576 point, um, 571.6 divided by 2 kilojoules plus 44 kilojoules. My delta H for my reaction here is equal to positive 41.2 kilojoules. We also have this thing called an enthalpy of formation. So I mentioned briefly a formation reaction before. A formation reaction is defined as forming one mole of a substance from its elements in their most stable form. So how much energy goes in to just form that substance? The standard enthalpy of formation, again, the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of a substance is formed from its elements in their most stable form. It is a shorthand for a very particular type of chemical equation, and I'll show you some examples of that in a sec. When I write delta H star, um, with that naught symbol, that little um, degree symbol on top that says delta H naught, sub F, F means formation, and that little um, degree symbol up there means standard. So what enthalpy change occurred when one mole of a substance was formed from its elements in their most stable form? It is the only type of reaction you can have that can actually have fractions in its balanced equation. Because by definition, it's forming one mole of a product, it may require fractions. We're going to see that on the very next slide. For CO, the delta H formation is negative 110.5 kilojoules per mole, write the corresponding thermochemical equation. Well, I'm trying to form one mole of CO graphite. It is being formed from the elements that make it up in their most stable form. So what goes into CO? Well, there's carbon and there's oxygen. But see, I know oxygen is a diatomic. Its most stable form is O2 gas. It doesn't just exist as O. I know carbon is graphite. How do I know that? I memorized it. Carbon's most stable form is graphite. But this reaction is not balanced. Now students will be tempted to put a 2 in front of here and a 2 in front of here. But that doesn't work because I want the delta H sub F. And sub F tells me one mole of product. So I'm required to use a fraction. Carbon plus a half of an O2 will give me CO. And the delta H formation here is equal to negative 110.5 kilojoules. So important. Sometimes fractional coefficients are required. We may not be able to avoid them. Ah, there it is. I knew it was somewhere. What about KClO3? If I tell you the delta H formation is negative 397.73 kilojoules per mole, Write the corresponding thermochemical equation. Well, I'm trying to form KClO3. I know that comes from potassium, chlorine, and oxygen. I know potassium is a solid. I know chlorine is a diatomic and a gas. Remember with your halogens, F2 and Cl2 are gases. Br2 is a liquid, and I2 is a solid. And I know oxygen is also a gas and a diatomic. So how can I balance this out? 
Well, I need one potassium. I have one potassium. I need one chloride. So I'm going to put a half in front of my chloride. And I need three oxygens. So I'm going to say three halves O2. Delta H formation, negative 397.73 kilojoules. And this entire thing is my um, delta H formation thermochemical equation. Because remember, thermochemical means it includes that delta H value. I have to include delta H. It's not just a balanced equation. The equation itself is not correct unless I have the delta H formation there because otherwise I couldn't have fractions. So which substances always have zero as their standard ultimate formation and why? Any substance or any, not substance, I apologize, any natural element in its most stable form. Why? Well, if I have oxygen gas, forming a mole of oxygen gas, delta H reaction here would be equal to zero because nothing happens. No heat had to go into the reaction to get that product to form. Nothing happened. As a consequence of Hess's law, though, we can use delta H formation values to calculate the delta H of an overall reaction. I call this your products minus reactants equation, but it's a little more complex than that. This is the actual formula. Delta H reaction is equal to the summation of the number of moles of product times the delta H formation for each specific product minus the summation of the number of moles of reactant times delta H formation for those specific reactants. N sub P and N sub R represent the stoichiometric coefficients from the balanced equation. Just remember products minus reactants, but you can't forget the coefficients in the calculation itself. Let's show you what I mean. Use the following standard enthalpies of formation to calculate the standard molar enthalpy of combustion of glucose. What is combustion? Combustion is when I react something, in this case glucose, C6H1206, with O2 to form CO2 and water. I need to balance this out. So six carbons, excuse me, six carbons, 12 hydrogens, 12 hydrogens. Let's see, on this side I have 12, 18 oxygen, six. I need a six here. So I got my reaction balance. What I want to know though, is the standard enthalpy, okay. I want to find delta H of combustion. That's what I'm trying to find. You could also call it delta H for reaction, but you can say combustion because it's a combustion reaction. Either one would be correct. Let me move this up just slightly. So how am I gonna do this? Well, I know my delta H reaction, or combustion, whichever one you wanna call it, is going to be equal to the products minus reactants calculation, right? So six moles, of CO2 times delta H formation of CO2 plus six moles of H2O times delta H formation of H2O minus my reactants, one mole C6H1206 times delta H formation, C6H1206, plus, I'm gonna run out of room, what do I have left? Six moles, O2, delta H formation of O2. So let's go ahead and put our values in. We've got our values in our table above. Delta H reaction. C6 
six moles of CO2 times the value of CO2 is negative 393.5 moles or kilojoules per mole. Six moles of water times the value of water is negative 285.8. That's kind of messy one second, sorry. 85.8 kilojoules per mole. Notice that's for water liquid. It does matter what phase you're in here. So if you're looking up these values in the back of your book, that's where they're at. They're in appendix in the back of your textbook. <coughs> Excuse me, you need to make sure you're looking up the right values. One mole of glucose times negative 1260 for glucose. And I didn't give you the value for oxygen. Why? Because it's zero. Because it's most stable state. That does say kilojoules per mole, it just doesn't look like it. If I don't give you the value, probably a pretty good guess it's zero. But again, it is zero because it's oxygen in its most stable state. So delta H free action here. Negative 2816 kilojoules. Because I'm adding things, it's got to keep precise to the ones place. And that's how I end up with so many sig figs. Let's do this one. Chromium metal used in chrome steel is obtained by heating the ore chromite, FeCr204, with carbon by the following reaction. And it gives me the delta H for the reaction. Given the standard enthalpy formation of carbon monoxide is negative, I'm going to put that up here, negative 110.5 kilojoules, calculate the standard enthalpy formation of FeCr204. So I want to know this. I'm not given this because it's zero. This is zero. And this is zero. <coughs> Excuse me, because it's its most stable form. I'm going to write this on top, though. I know delta H to reaction would be equal to my delta H of formation reactants or products minus reactants of Fe. One mole, let me actually do this correctly. One mole of Fe times delta H formation of Fe. Two moles of chromium. Delta H formation of chromium. Four moles of CO. Delta H formation of CO minus my reactant side, one mole of FeCr2O4, delta H formation, FeCr2O4, and four moles of carbon graphite times delta H formation of carbon graphite. But the thing is, I know that my delta H reaction here is equal to 988.4 kilojoules. So I'm going to plug everything in that I know. I know that this goes to zero. This goes to zero. This goes to zero. So I'm going to simplify this and not include those. 988.4 um, kilojoules is equal to zero plus zero, plus four times negative 110.5 kilojoules, minus delta H formation, FeCr204, should be one mole times that, I'm going to run out of room, I apologize, plus zero. Actually, hold on, I can fit that in. Move this over. It's one thing I don't like about these equations, they take forever to write out. Plus zero. Again, that second zero being for the carbon graphite. Solve this out. I get delta H formation of FeCr2. O four 
to be equal to negative 1430 point four kilojoules per mole. Now, where are my sig figs there? Subtraction, subtraction, one decimal place, one decimal place. Yeah, okay. 1430.4 kilojoules per mole. So we're just a couple more, diff more difficult problems. A um, handful of more difficult problems to kind of tie up this unit. In a coffee cup calorimeter, 1.5 grams of nickel 2 chloride is mixed with 50 grams of water at an initial temperature of 25 degrees C. After dissolution of the salt, the final temperature of the calorimeter contents is 24.25 degrees C. Assuming the solution has a heat capacity of 4.18 joules per gram degree C, and assuming no heat loss to the calorimeter, calculate the enthalpy change for the dissolution of nickel 2 chloride in units of kilojoules per mole. So, first thing I want to do, write out the first law in words. Heat lost by surroundings. Is gained by system. How do I know that heat has been gained? Because the surroundings lost the heat. What I am actually measuring here, and this is kind of hard again for students to visualize, but I've got coffee cup calorimetry, okay? So I've got two coffee cups nestled together. Inside here, I have a liquid. Inside here is the nickel two chloride splitting apart. I've got a thermometer in here, but the thermometer is measuring the solution. The solution is your surroundings. Why? Because the system is the nickel ions and chloride ions. So I'm measuring the surroundings. In the question, it tells me that the initial temperature was 25 degrees C. The final temperature was 24.25. That means the temperature decreased. So the reaction is endothermic. It takes heat to dissolve the nickel two chloride. Oops, sorry. So I know the surroundings lost the heat so the system could gain the heat. So negative Q of surroundings is going to be a positive Q of the system. Now this is one of the cases where I'm going to solve them separately. I'm going to solve for Q of surroundings. I know I'm going to use the MCAT equation. Why? Well, one, I'm doing constant pressure conditions, and I know it doesn't specify that, but two, I'm given a heat capacity, not a calorimeter capacity. I'm given a heat capacity, I'm give, and I'm given change of temperature. So because I'm given heat capacity, not calorimeter capacity. of the solution. Q equals cat is calorimeter constant. So, how much does my solution weigh? Well, I've got 50 grams of water, but I've also got 1.50 grams of the nickel 2 chloride. 
So my system actually weighs the whole th- surroundings, the cube of the surroundings, the whole thing, your solution contains your nickel two chloride ions. So it's the mass of the entire thing, 51.5 grams. Times Q, or sorry, times C, your specific heat capacity, 4.184 joules per gram degree C. Yes, I know it says 4.18. I have it memorized 4.184. I don't care if you use 4.18. Get to three sig figs. You're fine with that. I'm fine with that. <coughs> Excuse me. Times 24.25 degrees C minus 25.00 degrees C. Again, watch it right here. This is where you're going to make mistakes in your sig figs. When I subtract this, I get negative 0.75 degrees C. That is two sig figs. My degree C cancel with that degree C. My grams cancel and I get joules. I have two sig figs and it's negative 160 joules. That is the amount of heat the surroundings have lost to the system, which means that the system gained 160 joules of heat. But that's not what the question is asking. The question is asking for the enthalpy change in units of kilojoules per mole. So I need to figure out the number of moles of nickel 2 chloride that were actually dissolved. 1.50 grams nickel 2 chloride. One mole of nickel 2 chloride. If I add the molar mass of nickel 2 chloride, I get 129.6 grams. Gives me 0.0116 moles. And then I'm going to go ahead and calculate the final answer I actually want, which is delta H in units of kilojoules per mole. I know I have 160 joules. And it's 0.116 moles. So I'm going to convert that to kilojoules. I get 14 kilojoules per mole. So not a lot of heat went into it. 14 kilojoules is a pretty small amount, which also explains why nickel 2 chloride will actually dissolve. We'll talk more about this in second semester when we revisit thermo, um, thermodynamics. But the two competing factors in chemistry we really see play out is energy and disorder. And so although this system takes energy to actually dissolve the nickel 2 chloride salt, it still dissolves because it's producing more disorder in the system. What I mean by that is one nickel chloride breaks apart into nickel 2 plus and two separate chloride ions. So the disorder of the system is overriding the heat cost that the heat cost of heat for the solution um, for the salt to actually dissolve in solution. Let's work another one. In a coffee cup calorimeter, 50 mL of a 0.1 molar silver nitrate solution and 50 mL of a 0.1 molar HCl solution are mixed to yield the following reaction. The two solutions were initially at 22.60 degrees C. The final temperature is 23.40 degrees C. So, I see heat increased, or temp, sorry, temp increased. exothermic Q of the system is negative Q of the surroundings Q of the system or Q of the reaction whatever you want to call it is going to be negative and Q of the surroundings is positive uh, calculate the heat that accompanies this reaction in kilojoules per mole of silver chloride formed Assume the combined solution is a mass of 100 grams and a specific heat of 4.18 joules per gram degree C. Del what is the delta H this reaction? So, I've got a coffee cup. Coffee cup calorimetry means it's nestled in together. I've got a lid on this thing. I'm going to run out of room. I've got a thermometer in here testing my solution. And I've got my solution inside. So inside that solution is the reaction. 
where I've got the silver ions reacting with the chloride ions. The reaction is the system. So this is my system. The solution is my surroundings. In the question, it tells me silver nitrate is reacting with hydrochloric acid, forming AgCl, and then of course, whatever's left over, right? Let's see, oops, wrong button. H plus ions, and NO3 minus ions. Or you could write HNO3 if you really want to write it that way. I did that intentionally to try to kind of emphasize what these are, though. These are your spectators. So they're part of the solution, or part of surrounding, sorry. What we're given here is your net ionic equation. Because it's all I really care about. I don't care about the spectators. They're part of the surroundings. I know that I measured 50 mils of a 0.1 molar silver nitrate solution and 50 mils of a 0.1 molar HCl solution. I know delta H must be negative. Because it is an exothermic process. So what else do I know? Uh, I know I had 50 mils here. 0.1 molar and 50 mils here of 0.1 molar. Let's go ahead and figure out how many moles I have of each thing. Number of moles, silver nitrate. 0.1 molar is 0.1 moles of silver nitrate to one liter of silver nitrate. I'm gonna run out of room. I have 50 mils, 0 0.0500 liters. If I really want to get the silver ions, I can say one mole of silver ion for every one mole of silver nitrate. It gives me 0 0.00500 moles of silver ions. So I'm going to erase this and I'm going to write that under here. 0 0.00500 moles of silver ions. Because the slide is just not big enough, I'm going to erase all this for more space. Do the same thing for the chloride ions. Number of moles of Cl minus, if I'm starting with 0 0.100 moles of HCl per liter of solution, starting with 50 mils, 0 0.00500 liters, or I'm reacting 50 mils, one mole of chloride ions for every one mole of, um, of HCl, 0 0.00500 moles of Cl minus ions. I have equal molar of each one. It's a limiting reactant problem, technically, because I have moles for both reactants, but it's all one-to-one, -one, which means that neither one's actually limiting. They're reacting in a perfect molar ratio so that I don't have a limiting or axis reactant. Erase this. If I put the first law in words... The heat lost by the reaction must equal the heat gained by the solution. It's 
So negative Q of the reaction equals positive Q of the solution. Because again, the solution is what I'm measuring, but the reaction is what I'm actually interested in. We cannot directly measure the reaction. But we can calculate Q of solution. So let's do that. Q of the solution, 100 grams, 4.184 joules per gram degree C. And my temperature went, final temperature 23.40 degrees C, initial temperature 22.60 degrees C. Difference here is 0 0.80 degrees C, so two sig figs. Calculate this out, and I'm going to get negative 33, or 330 joules. Sorry, not negative, that's positive. I was reading the wrong thing on my notes. Positive 330 joules. But that means Q of my reaction is negative 330 joules. Now, in order for delta H to be specified number, um, delta H for reaction is for the specified number of moles of the reactants. The question wants delta H in kilojoules of, moles per, um, of kilojoules per mole of silver chloride. We need the moles of silver chloride that we have in the reaction. Looking at this reaction, if I reacted 0 0.005 moles of silver ions with 0 0.005 moles of chloride ions, I would produce 0 0.00500 moles of silver chloride. You can do the math on it if you want. So geometrically, you should be able to show that. You should be able to show, I'm going to move this up so I can write on here, um, 0 0.00500 moles of silver ions to one mole of silver chloride to one mole of silver ions equals 0 0.005 zero zero moles of silver chloride. And you should be able to prove that there's no limiting reactant. There may be if I give you a question like this. So you have to check which one is limiting. In this case, neither one is actually limiting. So I'm getting 0 0.05, um, 0 0.005 moles of silver chloride. My delta H my overall reaction here is my Q of my reaction divided by the number of moles of silver chloride in units of kilojoules per mole, negative 330 joules divided by 0 0.00500 moles of silver chloride, convert to kilojoules, over, um, kilojoules to moles, I get negative 67 kilojoules per mole of silver chloride. So a lot of thought went into that question, not so much work-wise, but a lot of thought goes into that question on how it's actually solved. Okay, what about this example? When 3.93 grams of lactic acid, C3H6O3, are burned in a bomb calorimeter. Okay, I see the word bomb calorimeter. I know that's going to be Q equals cat. That has a total heat capacity of 10.80 kilojoules per Kelvin. Oh, okay, I'm going to use Kelvin here instead of degree C. Totally fine. The temperature of the calorimeter increased by 5.43 um, Kelvin. So it's actually telling you my change in temperature directly. Nice. Assume that delta H reaction is equal to delta E reaction. Given the delta H formation of water is negative 285.8 kilojoules per mole and delta H formation of CO2 is negative 393.5 kilojoules per mole, calculate delta H formation of lactic acid. Okay, so I've got this here, I've got this here. I know that Q equals cat because it says bomb. It tells me the calorimeter constant is 10.80 kilojoules per Kelvin. And it tells me my temperature change is 5.43 Kelvin. This gives me 58.6 kilojoules. Now, I want this, 
I want to actually find the delta H formation. But I need to first find what does this actually mean. Lactic acid was burned in a bomb calorimeter. Cool. That means it was combusted, by the way. Because that's what com um, bomb calorimeters are doing. Is they're combusting it. C3H6O3 solid reacts with O2 gas to form CO2 and water. Balance this reaction out. Three carbon, six hydrogen, and I'm going to need a three in front of my O2 here to balance it out. Let's see. It tells me delta E. Okay, so the delta H here is equal to whatever I'm going to find in a sec, the kilojoules per mole of the reaction. So I'm going to determine in a sec. Um, and then I want to find the overall delta H sub F of here. I know that when 3.93 grams of lactic acid were burned, that 58.6 kilojoules of heat was released. Well, can I find my kilojoules per mole then to find my delta H of reaction? 58.6 kilojoules, 3.93 grams of lactic acid. I need that in moles. 90.08 grams of lactic acid. per one mole of lactic acid. Gives me 1340 kilojoules for this reaction. So I'm assuming this is this is equal to delta E, right? It's telling me assume delta H is equal to delta E. So I'm going to say, okay, the delta H for this reaction is 1340 kilojoules. Now I know the overall reaction. I know the delta H, the overall reaction. I can use Hess's law to solve the rest of the question. 1340 kilojoules is equal products minus reactants, three moles of O2, or sorry, three moles of CO, CO2, times the value for CO2 is negative 393.5, kilojoules per mole. Let's see, I've got three moles of water. Value for water is negative 285.8 kilojoules per mole. I'm trying to find this value for lactic acid. It's one mole of lactic acid, C3H6. O3 times what I'm trying to find, delta H formation of the C3H6O3, and 3 moles of O2, which I'm going to run out of room for, which has a value of 0 kilojoules per mole because it's most stable state. And summation of that. Solve this out. Delta H formation, sorry, this is so messy. It's just so hard for me to write on the bottom of the screen. Delta H formation of C3H6O3 is equal to negative 3380 kilojoules per mole. So kind of combining a couple of different concepts we've seen in the question. Okay, so we used our bomb calorimeter to find the delta E of the reaction. The question told us to assume that delta E and delta H were equal, which made it, you know, we were able to do that then, and then be able to use that with Hess's law to figure out the overall answer. And we have one more question to solve. <clears throat> Excuse me. The combustion of propane, C3H8, produces 2,220 kilojoules of energy per mole of propane consumed. What mass of grams of protein? What mass in grams of propane will be required to eat a fifty-three gallon um, gallons bathtub water from twenty-five degrees C to thirty-five degrees C if the process is eighty percent efficient? And it gives us a series of conversions: one gallon is three point one gallon is three point seven eight five liters. One calorie is four point one eight four joules. Density of water is one gram per mil, and the specific heat of water is one cal per gram degree C. So I know Q equals MCAT. 
Let's see. I know my mass. 53 gallon. 3.785 liters to one gallon. 1,000 mils to one liter. And one gram to one mil. 200605 grams of water. My sig figs are here. I'm just going to underline them for now. So I've got my mass, 200605 grams of water. One cal per gram degree C. And 35.0 degrees C as final temperature, minus 25.0 degrees C, which is my initial temperature. 2006050, so an extra number in here, calories. That's how much I need. But again, my sig figs are underlined. I should only have three sig figs. I just don't want to round yet. I know the reaction is, or the process, is only 80% efficient. So, of that 2006050 calories, only 80% is usable. To the 100% produced. One six zero four eight four zero cows need it. How much is that in joules? One six zero four eight four zero calorie. Four point one eight four joules to one calorie. Six seven one. 4651 joules. Looking pretty big numbers here. But if I put that into kilojoules, it wouldn't be so bad. 6,700 kilojoules. Um, and how many grams of this, of propane, does this actually correlate to? Number of grams, C3H8. I need 6714651 joules. And yes, I could have run it by this point, but I'm going to keep underlining those sig figs until the very end at this point. It's a commitment thing. Um, I've already done it. I might as well keep doing it. I know that one kilojoule is 1,000 joules. I know that one mole of propane, C3H8, produces 2,220 kilojoules of heat. And I know that propane weighs 40.09 grams so in order to heat a bathtub of water that contains 53.0 um, gallons of water from 25 to 35 degrees C with an 80% efficiency, I would need to burn 133 grams of propane gas.